With Nikki Haley out of the 2024 presidential race, President Joe Biden is swooping in to court the Americans who were planning to cast their ballot for the former South Carolina governor. Biden issued a statement yesterday writing, it takes a lot of courage to run for president. Nikki Haley was willing to speak the truth about Donald Trump. Donald Trump made it clear that he doesn't want Nikki Haley supporters. I want to be clear, there is a place for them in my campaign. He continued, I know there is a lot we won't agree on, but the fundamental issues of preserving American democracy, treating each other with decency and dignity and respect, I believe we can find common ground. Former Ohio State Senator Nina Turner told Next Star News Nation that she thinks it may be the Biden campaign's downfall. What we do know from the Biden uh, administration, or the Biden campaign itself, they are going to try to court those Nikki Haley voters. They are pivoting uh, to more moderate Republicans. They have totally turned their backs on progressives, it seems, as for this moment. But I caution uh, my party in turning their backs on the progressives because the progressive it, the progressives within the Democratic Party is where all the excitement is. And I am young enough to remember in 2022 when former Congressman Tim Bryan was running for the U.S. Senate right here in my home state. He tacked to the right. And that did not that did not come out really well for him, because in the end, the voters in Ohio voted for the real conservative and not the conservative light. Meantime, while Donald Trump bashed his former opponent, that didn't stop him from inviting Haley's supporters back to his corner, writing on Truth Social that he would further invite all of the Haley supporters to join the greatest movement in the history of our nation. Haley notably declined to endorse Trump in her exit speech, but she did encourage the former president to actually convince her voters to support him. Her supporters, on the other hand, are apparently not too thrilled about jumping back on the Trump train. In fact, they seem to be dreading both options in what looks to be a 2020 rematch per CNN. Oof, that seems to be the story more and more. I read an article that referred to them as double haters, uh, two historically unpopular candidates. A lot of people hate them both. I, I strongly believe if there, if, there is, if there are 10 double haters, I am one. If there is one double hater, I am the double hater. I mean, it's a really, I think, relatable category of people and a really relatable term. Obviously, there, there are huge numbers. So what, what do you make of this? Because I'm inclined to say, I'm with Nina Turner, that most people who genuinely are Republicans and conservatives and we're going to vote for Nikki Haley because they're conservatives but not wild about Trump for all the reasons, uh, are still going to want a Republican at the end of the day. And if they're voting against Joe Biden, they can do that by voting for Nikki Haley and then returning to Donald Trump in a general election. And that what you're doing when you're a Democrat that tries to pander to get Republican votes is that you end up alienating your base, and there's not a single Republican in the world who is going to say, well, I'm really uh, struggling with the border conflict, and I think that Joe Biden making gestures now to resolve it is going to inspire more confidence than Donald Trump, who's made that so such a core part of his image since he first came down the golden escalator. Yeah, I, I just, I think that there's a lot of, I think the sentiment is overblown that the Nikki Haley supporters are just never going to go back to Trump. Mm -hmm. There is so much time before the general election. We've seen this happen time and time again. It happened in 2016, right, where you had all of these disaffected Republicans who hated the idea of Trump. And as they got closer to the election and they saw who Hillary Clinton was and realized the reality of the binary choice that was facing them, yeah. decided to hold their nose and vote for him. And I sort of see the same thing happening here. Um, and, and I think it's worth pointing out, too, that the media kind of talks a lot about how um, Trump was going after Haley's supporters. And I think the, the reality of it is that he was talking about her mega donors when he was mm. saying that he didn't want them in his camp. Mm. And he didn't want the crossover Democrats who hate him so much that they would eschew their own party's primary in order to vote for Hillary or Haley. <laughs> I mean, what's the difference, really? <laughs> to vote for Haley uh, in yeah. an effort to stop him. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of exactly to your point, right? Like, why is he going to sit there and court people who hate him so much? much that they're going to vote in the opposing, change their party registration, vote in the opposing party's primary in an effort to stop him. He's never going to win those people over. Um, I think when you're talking about people who are Republicans who just don't really like Trump that much and thought Nikki Haley was their best option, they're going to come home at the end of the day. Yes, because they're Republicans. And Democrats do this, too. This is the this is the two-party trap. We've got two corporate parties that are very polarized against, uh, against each other. There are no 
viable in terms of winning elections at this juncture, third party alternatives. So your ability to express discontent, the avenues for you to express your discontent are very limited. Sometimes it will take shape in terms of a protest vote in a primary, an effort in a primary to see if you can at least change the top of the ticket. And we're seeing the uncommitted ballot line giving folks on the left ability to express discontent on a very specific narrow issue. And they're taking advantage of it in SCADs, as we've talked about uh, in a different segment. But at the end of the day, when it comes back down to the binary choice, most folks do fall back in line. I think that was both true of Donald Trump in 2016 and true of disaffected Democrats who were very frustrated by how Bernie Sanders was treated in the 2016 race, but overwhelmingly returned to Hillary Clinton. As much as the Bernie bros get flack, more Bernie Sanders supporters fell in line and voted for Hillary Clinton than Hillary Clinton supporters in 2008 fell in line and voted for Barack Obama. So really wrap your head around that. But here's the difference. The enthusiasm gap hugely favors Donald Trump. That's true. They might both have these disaffected voters that are out here in the middle that people are clamoring for, but at the end of the day, there are millions of voters who were genuinely enthusiastic about Donald, uh, about Donald Trump. And even at his best, when he won in 2020, a significant proportion of voters, when asked, said they voted for him, for, for Joe Biden, against Donald Trump, as opposed to anything affirmative. And that was when he was a relatively blank slate. He was the guy in the aviators who stood next to Obama, who everybody liked. Now he has a record that he yes. has to defend, and it's not looking good. Yeah, we have four years of Trump and three years of Biden that voters can compare. Um, coming up on four years of Biden that voters can compare. And uh, if that's the choice, especially for Nikki Haley voters, they're not happy with the state of the economy. They're not happy with what's happening on the border. They're not happy with foreign policy. Um, and one of the big sticking points for a lot of independents and sort of moderate Democrats is the issue of abortion. We saw this in 2022. But Trump is not a very radical right person on abortion. He supports a 16-week ban uh, in, in, in the states. He doesn't support a federal ban. Mm -hmm. um, he, of course, takes credit for the overturning of Roe v. Wade by the Supreme Court. But the framing on that is, for conservatives, obviously, is, well, it sent the issue back to the states, gave more power to the voters on abortion. So you can't really weaponize that from the left the way that it was in 2022, immediately after Dobbs came out and it was really fresh in people's minds. I know they're going to try to do that. One of the guests that um, the White House has confirmed they're bringing to the State of the Union tonight is the Texas woman mm -hmm. whose child had um, had tested positive for a disability and she had to travel out of state to get an abortion because Texas did not allow her to terminate her pregnancy. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. I will caveat that and say that there was some reporting from the New York Times, um, when was that, uh, recently, last month, that said that Trump was privately expressing support for a 16-week abortion ban. We brought this up on the show. Robbie made the point that the 16-week abortion ban isn't as unpopular as one might imagine in polls. And so that is also true. But to the same extent that I think you're right on the whole, that Donald Trump has been much less um, he's been pr he's presented himself as much less radical on abortion than some of the other Republicans. On the other hand, Joe Biden has also presented himself as less radical in a way that I think is not energizing the base on abortion. That's a good point. He recently um, uh, gave uh, had these remarks that were in a, I believe, a New Yorker interview where he said, um, quote, I've never been supportive of, you know, it's my body. I can do what I want with it. So he has had a long history as someone who is Catholic and who espouses a certain belief system as not exactly being the loudest, most vociferous cheerleader for the right to choose. And I think you're right that the freshness of Dobbs really benefited uh, um, uh, Democrats in midterms. And I have heard some liberal pundits saying, well, we're going to still be able to take advantage of that. That's still going to help us. People are going to be reminded of those issues closer to the election. And that might be true, depending on how effectively Democrats message on those issues. But again, it's a long way away from that. And as I think the longer that people live under a new status quo, rightly or wrongly, and I would say wrongly in this instance, the more they're inured to the reality. They get over it. In the same way that four years of Donald Trump made a lot of folks comfortable with Donald Trump. In 2016, before the election, there was a lot of, America's going to end. This is the end of democracy. And we get some of that because of 1-6.
but people really didn't think that Donald Trump, a game show president, was going to be able to run the country. And then people realized, well, you know, does the president do so bad. much? Like, <laughs> is he more of a figurehead? He's got a cabinet around him. We just covered a segment yesterday with Glenn Greenwald weighing in on uh, Victoria Nuland's uh, leaving office, uh, leaving her position. And he pointed out that She's someone who worked under Dick Cheney, someone who worked under Obama, someone who worked uh, under Biden, that the more things change, the more stay, uh, uh, stay the same, plus ça change. And, you know, I do think that that, again, is why we see this enthusiasm gap where a bunch of Democrats who might have been riled up to say, I got to stop Trump, are feeling less that way this time yeah, Well, around. it is kind of the reality that... Um even if you elect someone who is considered to be a disruptor of the system, you still have this massive government bureaucracy that, for the most part, runs things day to day. And and to Trump's credit, this is one of the things that I really like about his candidacy is he wants to change that system as much as he can to try to upend the bureaucracy. I know he says and, that. I know. And I, I'd like and, to and see some of that, too. I know. But then he has he has to also defend the fact that for four years he did not do that. I know. And that's one of my biggest criticisms yeah. of him. Yeah. Um, but you do see, uh, back to the abortion question, right? I mean, that's something that really energized specifically young voters and suburban female voters in the midterms. We now see those groups starting to drift back to 100%. Trump in the polling. And young voters in particular, which 100%. almost always vote heavily Democratic, should be a real wake-up call for Biden. Yes, and it, it shouldn't be forgotten that Biden has spent most of his presidency arguing that he can't do things because of narrow majorities in Congress or a divided Congress. And so to the extent that now he wants to make the argument that I'm going to be able to save democracy and codify Roe and do all of these other things, well, you've just spent years telling us that you can't do anything. And while magically we can say, well, if you keep voting for Democrats, we'll get the majorities that we need to X, Y, and Z, you've opposed filibuster reform, and you've put yourself in a position where you were a lame duck and effectual president for most of this time. After running, making a lot of very big promises, whether or not you agree with them, but very big promises to young people in particular about protecting reproductive rights and about um, helping them with one of their biggest financial loads, which is the 44 million Americans with student debt that you told you were going to cancel their student debt. 44 million Americans, and you fundamentally did not do so. And you keep putting out these press releases saying, oh, I canceled 100,000 people's debt here and there. 44 million is the number that he promised. And if you go and talk to any young people or look at any comment thread on any kind of youth website, shade room, whatever it is, you will see that people have not forgotten that. I think it's interesting, too, that um, as he's making this argument about how he can't do anything without Congress, he is trying to use that to reframe the border issue mm -hmm. um, in a way that suggests that, you know, if Republicans don't pass the Senate mm -hmm. bill that was bipartisan in the sense it was negotiated by like the two most moderate establishment members of the sure. Republican Party, um, that they that they now take ownership of the border crisis. And it's it just, I, it flummoxes me how he thinks the American people are going to buy that when he's had three years to take any action on it if he actually cared about it. The first thing he did when he came into office was strip back every single executive order that Trump had implemented on the border. Um, and then uh, things predictably went to where they were, where they are now. And uh, the Republicans decided to bring up H.R. 2 as their proposed border security bill. The Senate wanted nothing to do with it, came up with what I, I'm sure we disagree with on this. But I'm sure I, we do. Yeah, but I consider it like a very weak uh, bill that doesn't really address border security. I, I call it a processing bill. Um, but just to go that route of you undo everything your predecessor did, things predictably go crazy, Republicans offer a solution out of the House, you end up going with what is fundamentally a Democrat bill out of the Senate and then say, well, if Republicans don't pass my bill now, then it's their fault. I just, is that really going to work on a messaging so, standpoint? I mean, I disagree with a lot of the characterization the there, premise, but suffice yeah. it to say this, this is an example of how neither of us are happy right. with the, the <laughs> actions that are taken, right? So I might dispute your characterization, but at the end of the day, I'm also frustrated with Biden because I see the bill as too far right and not getting to the core of what's causing the influx of immigration at the border anyway. So is this an example of the fact of the idea that he's adopted the wrong strategy and maybe Nina Turner in the clip that we played is completely right, that your best bet is to play to your base and at least be able to make the people who you're supposed to be catering to happy as opposed to shooting for some middle ground where nobody is. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the, he's trying to thread a needle that really doesn't have a hole in it. And one of the things that Trump is really uh, quite good at in, ter in terms of his political stature is he's able to find the issues that he can move a little bit to the middle on without alienating his base. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll have more rising for you after this. Do stick around.